Hey, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Logos Project. This is your host, Dom, and in today's video, I'm joined by Timothy Flanders. Tim, how are you doing today? Hey, I, I'm too blessed to be stressed, my brother. How are you doing, man? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, Timothy is the editor-in-chief of 1 Peter 5, and uh, he wanted to talk to me about the uh, Society of St. Pius X, why I arrived at the views I did, and, you know, traditionalism in general. So, uh, Tim, it's a pleasure to talk with you, and uh, I'm glad to be able to do this. Um, you know, nice, friendly back and forth. <laughs> so welcome once again. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I know we've uh, talked a little bit privately and emailing, and so I'm glad to yeah. talk with you uh, yeah. virtually, uh, yeah. at least. But here, I, I have a burning question for you before we begin. Okay, what, sure. What is the series of books you have right behind your head? What, <laughs> what is that? Uh, yeah, that's St. Thomas's works uh, wow. Summa, with the Summa Cotrangiatiles. It's most of them. It's not all of them. I think some of them are still being printed, uh, but it has the Latin on one side and the English on the other. Ah, uh, I yeah. see. Okay. So are, are you a Thomist? Is that, uh, would you call yourself a Thomist? Um, I don't know. I, uh, I I think Thomists wouldn't call me a Thomist. So, oh, uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I would say I love St. Thomas and he's, he's he is the foundation specifically like metaphysically he's the foundation of a lot of my studies the you know when i approach a, a question i always ask myself okay how would thomas answer this you know i start with thomas i do go beyond him after that but i always start with him yeah well it's a great place yeah. to start of course Fantastic. yeah <laughs> okay yeah right so uh, where do you want to take this tim you know feel free to uh you know to lead this conversation i can oh you know, okay in, in, well if, if you want to i can if you want so well uh I, sure i i mean um well <clears throat> yeah so you were were you raised in the sspx yeah no it's, yeah exactly so i i grew up in france um and uh grew up in the society of st Pius X. was baptized into the society of st Pius X. um we went to their masses i went to their schools um two different uh three different schools uh, and, uh, one of them was a boarding school and, uh, actually I have stories about, about that. We were uh, situated right below a world war one battlefield and there was craters for where the bombs were dropped. And so, but that was our playground, you might say for, for the, for the kids, it was all boys school. And, um, uh, this school was in the North of France. So you had a lot of kids from Belgium and from great Britain. And of course you had the French kids. We also had a couple Canadians and one American other than me. So it was a it was a it was a mix of uh, students. And um, but so if you're interested, this is like kind of a funny story. But, uh, you know, back then I didn't know the difference between, you know, the differences between Britain and France, you know, historically. So during recreation, we'd uh, basically um, start these kind of groups and have wars where we'd get on, on the shoulders of the other kid. We'd have our shield and our, you know, our stick. And, um, you know, I, I was trying to say, okay, where can I fit in? And turns out I spoke English because uh, my mother spoke English and she spoke to us in English. So I fit in with the Brits. And so I sided and joined the British army, you might say. And, um, you know, during recreation, we'd fight the French and fight the, the Belgians. And uh, <laughs> several years later, I look back and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I was a traitor. <laughs> So that was kind of fun. But uh, yeah, that was um, that was probably um, two of my best years uh, in my life in that boarding school. So, oh, okay. um, yeah, it was really great. Um, but I mean, talking about society, I also had, you know, you know, experiences where it's like that doesn't seem right to me. And uh, that's part of what got me asking questions. But yeah, after that, we moved to France and joined the fraternity of St. Peter. Uh, I can't remember why. I think it was because Benedict got uh, elected and uh, things were seeming to get better uh, the way we uh, saw things. And eventually the motu proprio came out. And um, uh, yeah. And so after that, after high school, I joined the monastery, Clear Creek Abbey in Oklahoma. And, you know, I, I tell this story often uh, to my friends, but, you know, theology was kind of boring to me. It was it was memorized, you know formulas from the Baltimore Catechism. It was, um, you know, a, a dry manuals, you might say, kind of confessional manuals. Moral theology was very what you can and cannot do. <clears throat> uh, so, I, you know, I wanted nothing to do with theology. So I was more interested in philosophy. You know, the as a as a teenager, I'm like, oh, what's infinity? Does God exist? You know, stuff like that. 
Uh, but it was when I was at the monastery that I discovered uh, sacred scripture in a new way. Um, because, you know, I had always been exposed to scripture, but it hadn't really crossed that barrier of affecting me. It was just kind of something I heard at mass and, um, you know, I had to get better at my, at my Latin eventually to uh, understand it. And even then I wouldn't pay close attention. So a lot of this is my fault, but at the monastery, they made us write commentaries on scripture, uh, copy commentaries on scripture on the Psalms specifically. And, uh, I discovered the personality of the of the Isra of the Israelite people, you know, and of the psalmist too. How uh, how raw and authentic he was, and that became very interesting for me. The historical aspect, and so that's when I got into theology. And uh, but yeah, so that that was during the reign of Pope Benedict, and uh, I think a lot of these disputes that have arisen uh, were much less pronounced. Thanks be to God during during his reign. And uh, anyway, eventually I left the monastery and uh, kind of wandered around thinking, what do I do now? And so I joined the military. My brother was going out and I came in and, uh, you know, I kept practicing my faith, but it kind of took a back seat because I was with I was working with a bunch of secular friends. But eventually I made Protestant friends and that's when it came back up. The whole oh, okay. Catholicism. Yeah. And let, so let me ask you, let me quick, let me go back ahead. up just a minute. Go ahead and ask you a, a relevant question. Yeah. Um, uh, what are one to three things that you feel grateful for for the SSBX? Yeah. Oh, uh, many things. <clears throat> well, um, I would say my knowledge of the liturgy. So I served mass a lot. Um, uh, so just understanding the way the liturgy works, um, uh, memorizing the mass, you know, like passages in the mass and the responses, even the prayers that the priest said with my missile. Um, so liturgy is definitely one of them. Uh, another one might be uh, just a sound foundation in, in, in the historical aspect, you might say, of the faith in the sense where I did get the, the catechism. I did get, you know, Thomas trickled down. You know, some argue not very well. I, it doesn't matter to me. I, I did get that strong foundation you might say in what we kind of lost after the council, if that makes sense. Um, so that's, that's another one. That'd be two. <laughs> um, the sense of, of culture, especially in France, the SSPX in France is, uh, you know, it has deep roots culturally. So hymns to the blessed Virgin, to the saints and uh, a, a sense of, of Catholic history, Catholic identity, you know, the, the kind of Catholic banners we had, the flags, like the French flag with the sacred heart, um, that, that whole cultural atmosphere, when I look back at it, I, I have a lot of nostalgia, if that makes sense. And um, uh, yeah, and also the scouting uh, program in France is very different from in the U.S. There was a Jesuit priest. What was his name? Uh, I think it's Father Jacques Sauvin. What he did is he he was French, obviously. He went to Britain and met up with Lord Baden-Powell, the founder of scouting. He wrote this book, Scouting for Boys. And, you know, he became friends with him, you know, spent some time with him and then came back to France. And what he did is he Catholicized uh, the scouting method, changed the, the scout law, made it much more uh, biblical and, and introduced the concepts of knighthood, you know, chivalry and uh, with the French history. And and uh, so that whole scouting experience, which is closely associated with um, with traditional Catholic movement in general in France, they also have it outside of it. But the the traditional scouts are the real deal, you know? So uh, all of that, that culture, the liturgy, that Catholic knowledge of, of uh, you know, the tenets of uh, the faith, that a lot of which was lost after the council, all of that I'm extremely grateful for. Awesome. So yeah. that, that's great. My, my son and I participated in, in the Catholicized version of Scouts in really? the United States, yeah. in, which is uh, actually founded by Taylor Marshall. It's called Troops of oh, St. Yeah. George. Yeah, I've heard we, about them. We heard of it. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. fantastic. I really we're actually going on a camp out this weekend. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. yeah. So okay. So um, so okay. So sorry to derail that. I just want to like no, that's fine. Get that that part because yeah. I was talking to Andrew Bartell and he kind of seemed to imp uh, imply that too that he was grateful for some things and it's yeah. I think it's important to just sure, give credit yeah. where it's due even though we disagree ultimately on on major issues but um yeah yeah uh so okay so you you were saying that you left the monastery and then you had some present friends but you had kind of faith had kind of taken a back seat a little bit yeah and then it kind of came up more with your present friends 
Yeah, because, you know, at that point, I'm like, okay, they're Christian, too. I'm Christian, uh, but we're not the same kinds of Christian. Uh, and so that's when I was like, okay, uh, I started to to think I need to take my faith more seriously again. Uh, <laughs> that shouldn't be a thing I should tell myself, but that's what happened. And so I basically started looking online. I found Catholic Answers, you know, kind of the initial, um, you know, where can I find answers for uh, when I talk with my Protestant friends? And so what happened was I was building a toolbox of good um, objections and responses in apologetics to other Christians. Uh, but I felt dissatisfied because anyone can do that if you think about it. You know, uh, a Mormon can do that. Uh, an Episcopalian can do that, although Mormons are not Christians. But uh, anybody can construct, you know, defenses and objections, uh, you know, with logic and scripture and all that kind of stuff. I, I felt like I needed a kind of substructure uh, from which to come up with an answer when a question was posed, even if I wasn't ready for it, if that makes any sense. So then I started going deeper and I read Scott Hahn's Kinship by Covenant. <clears throat> um, it's I think it's his doctoral dissertation. That yeah. book that yeah, that that book opened scripture up for me in an incredible way. And I felt like I didn't any longer need to make an objection or uh, propose uh, alternative view by using scripture verses here and there. Rather, I can understand the the kind of heart of scripture and the logic of scripture from below, like a hermeneutic, and then apply that when, anytime someone had a question for me or when I had a question for them. How do you square this with this theme in scripture? So that was so much more effective. And I realized I needed to do more of this. So I, I decided, you know what, I need to go study. And so I, 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 um, I started to study theology and philosophy uh, in, in college, and uh, that's when I encountered um, John Paul II's Theology of the Body. And when I first took this class, uh, before I started it, I was like, I, I'm actually I wasn't looking forward to it because uh, I had heard Theology of the Body is like Catholic sex ed. It's going to be kind of crude and boring and whatever. And so I was like, ah, but I got to take it. It's part of the curriculum. And then I made my way through those audiences uh, in the late seventies, early eighties. And what I found, I did not expect. My whole world just flipped upside down. And I felt not only did I have answers based on scripture for my Protestant friends, but I had bigger answers for atheists, agnostics, and Protestants, Anglicans, and even Eastern Orthodox, thanks to Theology of the Body, which is all-encompassing worldview. So that really did it for me. And eventually what happened is I discovered Ratzinger, and I've been reading him uh, ferociously. Uh, his big main works, uh, Intro to Christianity, Eschatology, and Principles of Catholic Theology are the kind of three big ones that I can uh, think of, uh, other of his little ones too. But about the SSPX, what started to happen during my studies and a little bit before was uh, the pontificate of Pope Francis was making a lot of those people with whom I had grown up, you know, uncomfortable. And then Traditionis Custodes hit, and I think all hell broke loose in the, especially in the uh, you know, some European uh, countries, but in the American church as well. So that's when I was like, okay, I need to have an answer for this situation. I need to know what to do. I need to know what's responsible, you know, uh, what's a good answer. You know, what about the papacy? Did we get something wrong? <laughs> All that stuff, right? And so that that basically led me to where I'm at, where it's like, you have different kinds of papacies throughout church history. Uh, but what does it mean that uh, the papacy may not be prudent, but it's safe in its official teaching. So the gradations and the and magisterial teaching, all that kind of stuff. And uh, and so that got me on to, okay, what about people who reject an ecumenical council or part of it or who are uncomfortable with it? What about other councils? All these questions became relevant. And so I the SSPX question wasn't for a while because you know no one was really talking to me about it. And I wasn't really online. I started a podcast and it eventually became YouTube. And that's when the SSPX question popped up. I met Andrew in school, actually, and uh, uh, he was from the SSPX as well growing up, and he had left. So we had some stuff in common, and uh, so that's what happened. And then we kind of looked at this, and especially in light of TC, uh, the SSPX has become an option when we thought it really should not be one, and that's when our work happened. We wanted to warn people. We know TC is you know, uh, troubling a lot of people but the solution isn't the sspx and that's kind of what motivated our work if that makes sense so when 
when was the was this the first time that you started to kind of question the SSPX? Oh, I see. It sounds like, or yeah, no, um, you know, it wasn't a that relevant of a question, but it wasn't then that I started to question it. I started when we moved to the fraternity of St. Peter, you know, the idea was placed in me that communion with Rome is important. Uh, and that's why we moved to the fraternity of St. Peter. In fact, that's why the fraternity of St. Peter itself was, was started. Communion is important. And so that's the first, you know, phase where I'm like, okay, well, SSPX, you know, they got good stuff, but communion is important. So no SSPX, fraternity of St. Peter. The next step was in the monastery at Clear Creek. I started to realize what's well, more than that, you know, because in the in the on the ground, you might say in the fraternity of St. Peter, you have a mixed bag, but you definitely have people who are suspicious of the council. You won't usually have someone who outright says it teaches heresy, but I have encountered that. But, you know, there's bad apples everywhere, I guess. Uh, but and so the thing is, that's when I started to realize uh, in Clear Creek, because they they cherished the council. They um they applied it too in the way they lived their monastic life. You know, the decrees on monastics, on uh, uh, religious orders, on the liturgy. Uh, and yet when it was beautiful liturgy, it was, it was a Benedictine um, version of the Roman Missal. Um, so it didn't have prayers for the altar, no last gospel. Uh, the read readings were read facing the people with the monks in between the, the reader and the people. In Latin, of course, the, everything was in Latin there uh, because the monks had to know some Latin. Uh, you know, event, a lot of Latin actually eventually, but <clears throat> yeah, so the council was being cherished and implemented and uh, lived at Clear Creek. And, and I thought Clear Creek was, you know, traditional list in a certain sense before I joined. So that was a paradigm shift. And that made me realize, you know, okay, the, an attitude that is antagonist to the council seems to also be problematic. So I, I'm progressing, if you can notice throughout my, my, uh, developments and eventually after clear creek and then when i started to talk with protestants i started to realize that uh church history and the direction it takes and and some of the theologians like john paul ii and joseph ratzinger are huge assets in navigating modern christianity and that's when i was kind of fully sold on okay i think traditionalism is not the answer neither is progressivism there's got to be uh a way that is faithful uh, but isn't suspicious of the council, you might say. That's kind of where I landed. So that's why I don't call myself a traditionalist. You know, I don't call myself progressive either. Um, but because what came to be associated, and I know this is disputed, but what came to be associated with traditionalism is a culture of um, um, suspicion towards the council, and especially the new missile, and that's a whole can of worms. But that, that would be where I landed, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, I'd love to hear you elaborate more on <clears throat> how the council was cherished at Clear Creek. You mentioned a few liturgical mm. differences yeah. and you mentioned, I think it's Perfecte Caritatis, if I recall, the, the decree on religious from Vatican II. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the title, but okay. I think yeah, it, that's I probably it. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah, <laughs> could you elaborate more on that? Uh, Vatican II at Clear Creek. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, as a novice, especially someone who had not really studied the council at all, uh, you know, looking back, it's hard to um, decipher exactly how that took place. But what I do know is there was this, uh, you know, the, the Pope's Wednesday audiences were always read during the meals. There was never a kind of uh, recognize and resist towards the what was coming from Rome in general. It was cherished, it was listened to, and it was uh accepted with devotion around me that was the culture that, that i was living in and the council yeah i mean the, the liturgy it wasn't what i had found in the society or the fraternity uh but it was um it, it wasn't the new missile either although the new missile was said by visiting priests on occasions uh who you know didn't know the older form but the benedictine uh liturgy is not the same as the you know the secular priest secular not here not meaning bad but meaning non-religious priests so the, the the benedictine liturgy is a thing on its own to begin with so that right there kind of showed me that you know there's more flexibility and more variety but it was for lack of a better term i don't think this is helpful but it was the traditional mass you might say uh but you know there was an incorporation 
very clearly of elements of Sacrosanctum Concilium and the facing of the people during the liturgy of the word. Um, the um, There was a kind of noble simplicity, uh, although on feast days, it got really pompous, which is awesome. I love that, you know. <laughs> so, it, <laughs> so uh, you know, I just, I felt like if I had, if I, if I you know, looking back now that I have read Sacrosanctum Concilium a few times and looking at Clear Creek, I'm like, yeah, that, that jives. You know, I feel like uh, if people had done what Clear Creek is doing, that would have been, I think, uh, a good post-conciliar application of that document. Um, yeah, so I hope that helps. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned the beginning of this conversation. You mentioned mm -hmm. the SSPX was preserving a lot of things that were lost after the council. Yeah. <clears throat> so do you do you see the traditional movement as a whole as serving some good uh, in the history of the church in this time? Um, so that's, that's such a complicated question, I think, because during Pope Benedict, especially with, you know, I really see Pope Benedict as a, a kind of a Pope of peace. Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, chill over here, you chill too, you know. <laughs> uh, but, um, and so uh, what was happening under Pope Benedict is in diocesan parishes, what you had was, Catholics who were coming to the those traditions that had been lost immediately after the council, which I wasn't alive during that time. So, you know, what I say is, you know, contingent, but Catholics that weren't from the SSPX or fraternity or even the Institute, which is its own separate thing. It's not, you know, it's not from the SSPX like the fraternity was, but they were just regular Catholics coming to this liturgical tradition. Um, and there wasn't that baggage, you might say. And so that was something I thought, yeah, that's what we need. We need more of this kind of cross-fertilization, as Pope Benedict said. Um, but when it comes to the kind of Ecclesia Dei um, traditionalist communities, Institute Christ King is kind of its own thing. But, you know, there, there was uh, a kind of historical baggage. And so today with this pontificate, uh, there seems, you know, the Holy Father seems to be kind of want to move on. And I, I prefer Pope Benedict's way of approaching this, to be honest. Right. But I'm not I'm not the pope. And so, but here's, here's the question. Okay. Let's, what do we need to do now in light of what's going on and something we can't control? Well, we, we can't hold on to the baggage. I'd like to hold on to what we had during Benedict. So I try to push that on my channel, but the term traditionalist, I think now has become historically embedded in that baggage. And I know people don't agree with me on that, but, you know, having been in those circles, it, it, you know, it's just been my experience everywhere. And I've, you know, I've been in France, Italy, Belgium, Canada, and the U S when it comes to traditionalist groups. And there is that baggage everywhere I've been. So well, tell me about the baggage. What do you mean by that? Is it just yeah. like bitterness? What exactly? So is that? It's, it's not necessarily like a disposition of bitterness that doesn't exist. Obviously I think you and I both know that, but it, that wasn't really my issue. My issue was, for example, even like, at the seminary in Nebraska, of uh, the fraternity of St. Peter, um, you know, I was, I was hearing from certain seminarians, like the new catechism is filled with uh, modernism, right? The 1992 catechism. So I'm like that at, at that time, I'm like, that doesn't really jive, but I kind of brushed it aside. Um, so kind of suspicion of the council, especially it's ambiguous, but we can work with it, you know? <laughs> um, and I think there wasn't a, a profound knowledge of what the council was trying to do and who its architects were. And the moment I said, I say architect, what I noticed is people thought, okay, modernist theologians. Um, now there was all stripes at the council, but really it was diving deep into the council that made me realize there's something more profound happening here in the trajectory of the church. Sure. It got co-opted after by the progressives. You know, I'm not denying that, but in the fraternity and society, there was a general, suspicion of the council when the council was brought up there was always a kind of knee-jerk reaction um you know let's i think it's better if we use uh the preconciliar popes let's not really quote john paul ii or benedict or the council we'll just stick to that and that's the thing with the fraternity is like because they left the society in order to be in communion because communion is important which was drilled into me which is good um 
you, you do have that kind of legal canonical and it's all good to go. They have, you know, they have a canonical mission. They, their sacraments are valid and licit and they're in communion with the church. It's, you know, if you want to go to mass there, go right ahead. I'm not trying to say anything against that, but you did have a kind of cultural knee jerk reaction to when the council and the modern magisterium is brought up. So just to be safe, we stuck with the preconciliar popes from like Pius the ninth to Pius the 12th or something. So, uh, um, would you say that there's also a knee jerk on the other side from, uh, even good Catholics? There's kind of like, you go to a, like a good diocesan seminary. Yeah. What I've been told this is what I've mm -hmm. been told. I don't know for sure, but yeah, you go to a good diocesan seminary and they don't get taught the preconciliar stuff. Yeah. They don't get San Alphonsus for moral theology. They got only the communio guys. Yeah. Well, I think St. Alphonsus uh, is actually, um, so Father Pinkers has a great book called Morality of the Catholic View. And, and St. Alphonsus, I think, was doing the best he could with the context that was problematic. And uh, so this is, I think, an instance where the reform, the, the project of reform was good here. And I think it's good that we move away from the context of St. Alphonsus and Father Pinkers gets into this. And this isn't some kind of progressive moral theology thing. It's, um, you know, uh, conservative Catholics all acknowledge this. Even some Thomas like uh, Father Ambrose Gardet, uh, he has a book, The True Christian Life, translated by Dr. Minard, uh, basically saying the exact same thing as uh, Father Pinkers on this area. So that I would say, yet in that case, I think we're right to go ahead and let's move on from that context. St. Alphonsus is great. He was, I think, doing the best. That's why he was declared a doctor of moral theology, doing the best in that context. But I think theologians agree the context was problematic. A kind of it was influenced by um, voluntarism, and eventually in the 19th century, it was influenced by Kant's kind of categorical imperative. We needed to move away from from that more into a teleological understanding of morality, which it leads to happiness, the Beatitudes, uh, you know, on the Sermon on the Mount, stuff like that. Uh, so w would you say that there is not a sort of knee-jerk reaction against? If, sorry, I didn't, I, I, yeah, I didn't answer your question. Um, well, so if D Dr. Larry Chap has this video, uh, I, I wish I, uh, if I can, uh, I'll go ahead and link it underneath in the show notes for, for both of us. Um, he's got a video where he talks to a seminary rector and uh, I want to say after the council, you're you're completely correct. Uh, there was a huge push of Karl Rahner, uh, you know, all these kind of more progressive theologians who didn't really get get, you know, they didn't really win at the council. So they're getting uh, the post conciliar, uh, you know, mess. And so, yeah, after the council, that definitely was the case. But things, especially thanks to the work of Pope Benedict, have really changed in diocesan seminaries. So now I think actually you have a lot of seminaries going back, going back to the Thomists, um, to Lagrange and Gardet and stuff like that. So uh, at first, yes, after the council, I did, I did see that knee-jerk reaction. Everyone was just reading Rahner. You were suspicious if you even touched Balthazar, which trads think is a modernist, right? But now, no, now I think seminarians are reading the Thomists. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I would attribute part of this good. I mean, yeah. My my hypothesis is that there, yeah. there does need to be obviously there needs to be a resource I'm yeah. I'm coming from an Eastern Orthodox perspective coming into yeah, the realm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I view Vatican II as a, a great good in yeah, yeah. and that from the Eastern perspective, mm -hmm. but also from the Eastern perspective, we cannot set like you mentioned St. Alphonsus. Yeah. Um what I guess uh, or, or, it, or in another, another, another subject is mm -hmm. the atonement. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I talked with Chris Plants a lot about this. Yeah, had, I remember we had a stream like two years ago, I think, about this, like where, yeah. um, you have the Roman Catechism saying one thing, and then mm -hmm. you have the New Catechism saying something else, and sort of omitting what the Roman Catechism said. Yeah, and I'm saying, it seems to me that we need to take both. And not throw out one, but integrate yeah. the old into the new, so mm -hmm. that there is a, a balance, a holistic per perspective on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not a knee jerk reaction against only I, post I, until you're only pre conciliar. No, no, great. Yeah. So, you know, uh, more and more, a certain schemata has been uh, emerging for me in my reading, which is you have these good things being taught. 
but sometimes, as you pointed out, at the expense of other elements, and that's why we would kind of need a, a synthesis, you might say. Uh, and then I read the texts of the reform, and then I read the way they're interpreted. And I see this kind of schema where you start with something true is said, but needs to be properly emphasized in a context of other truths. Then you look at the documents of the council and the magisterium, and you have a re restoration of that emphasis. But that restoration of that emphasis is then read contrary to the past by subsequent people who receive it. I think the reason why is because um, when that was changed, because there's this kind of resentful focus on moralism, like you might, you might say, legalism, like you know, some people accuse St. Alphonsus, I think it's misplaced, but, you know, and uh, too much focus on the atonement. Let's be happy Easter people, you know, although, see, when John Paul II said it, we're Easter people, I think he meant that in the richest and fullest sense. But people, because of that reaction, are taking the corrective of the church and applying it by reading a rupture from those other truths. So I don't blame the church for that. But I can see how now I think we're, we're it's like the pendulum swing. All right, let's go ahead and talk again about those things because people didn't get the memo. You see what I'm saying? I know that's a very vague thing to say, but that's the kind of pattern that's been emerging for me uh, with this whole debate. So, uh, you know, can yeah. traditionalists bring back that emphasis? Well, well, yeah, but my problem is I think they're, the, what they're bringing back is those old truths, but they, they don't want the contextualization, you might say, that was subsequently given. And so that's where uh, I think that's the baggage again. But, you know, people disagree with me. So <laughs> so is this the uh, I mean, I, mean I, don't, I don't disagree with the basic yeah. stuff you're saying here. I mean, the yeah, trad yeah. movement, I think we we as trads, we've got issues, we've got baggage and whatnot. Yeah. Um, I just think that there's a, a, a certain fundamental truths yeah. that are being fought for by the trads, which are true. Yes. And I think that most Catholics would agree with those fundamental truths. Yeah. Uh, like the liturgy yeah. should not be destroyed. Like yes. fundamental truth. <laughs> uh, so, yes, I agree. Um, but why don't, why, don't, why don't I ask you about what is, maybe this is getting into your definition of what is radical traditionalism mm -hmm. because that's the subject of a few of your videos would you yeah. say that radical traditionalism is this sort of isolating baggage suspicious mentality what exactly is yeah that? i mean i i think you kind of put it well that's the way i would think of it but just to add real quick because i watched your video with dr larry chap and i watched your video with dr richard de and you know and I, i'm I, i'm nodding my head during the entire video like for both of them so I think you and me are pretty much very close, but um, when it comes to, yeah, the, the traditionalist movement, what I call radical traditionalism would be basically that baggage is still there. And I think people don't know it. And part of those videos is me trying to show people there is a lack of balance here. We need to uh, take into account what the council sought to say, not just react against it. That, that's basically in a nutshell what I think radical traditionalism is. It's a reaction against the authority of the church in its council. Now, that takes various shades and emphases. Uh, it can go from outright rejection to just a mere suspicion. Uh, not, But here's the thing. like I think we can, you know, we can come to a conclusion that sometimes in councils there's passages that, uh, you know, obviously are not wrong. But you can see like a, a debate wasn't settled or it's, you know, there's some there's a question here that we need to think about more. But I think that applies to all councils. But I don't believe in a kind of weaponized, like, you know, evil, suspicious uh, people trying to use the divine authority of the church, you know, given by Christ to destroy the faith. That's when it's like, no, that that destroy. That's not traditional. That, that goes against what, we, what we've been taught for 2000 years. So, yeah, I, I guess I, I would I would allow more evil men at all councils uh well i'm not i'm that. not denying there's evil people at councils like you know like uh -huh. nicaea it was filled with arians what i'm saying is that when the church teaches um oftentimes we 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 have a kind of modern newtonian view of like which character is responsible for what you know what part makes up this whole but i think a, a, a older view is this understanding that the church herself is a subject and she has her own intentionality and it, it comes from the tradition. This is the whole hermeneutic of, of uh, continuity. And when the church as a subject teaches, you know, we can't confuse that with a particular character at a council. It's one of the principles you find in the Gospel of John. It's not directly analogous, but the principle is there, which is Caiaphas saying it's better that one man die rather than 
uh, all the people or uh, something to that effect. Clearly what he meant was not what was uh, then interpreted by Sion in the gospel. And so that's kind of what I'm saying. We have to be able to distinguish between human elements and human uh, actors and then the subject, the subjectivity of the teaching church and what she is trying to say. And I'm saying we can't hack what the church is trying to say. We can complain about what uh, human beings are doing and saying, but that's different. Anyway, that, that's, that's what I think. Yeah, I, this would be the distinction that I make between a, the theological meaning of a council yeah. and mm -hmm. the historical yeah. significance of a council. Because yeah. there is, and I would put, I would place dubia coming out of Vatican II as well as Vatican mm -hmm. One. Yeah. I would, I would, I would see all of this as a um, <clears throat> the church's larger response to modernity. Yes, has yeah. both this sort of the PN magisterium period yeah. of Pius the Seventh to Pius the Twelfth, as yeah. well as this John the Twenty Third to the present period. Yeah. yeah, and there, there is, there are significant truths in both of these approaches to liberalism and all of the things that yeah. came after. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the councils seem to me, every council seems to have a theological meaning, which yeah. is interpreted according to the mm -hmm. intention of the Holy Spirit, the theological norms of interpretation, which can more or less be abstracted from whatever went down at the council, even if, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I, I bring up the Council of Ephesus as a particular example, because in that council, Artemis Ephesia is dethroned and Our Lady Theotoko yeah. is enthroned. And that's the theological meaning of the council. And it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But what actually happened at that council was a big scandal. Mm -hmm. A bunch of people were terrorizing the city of Ephesus and whatnot. And it was uh, a serious problem to the point that they had to have a reunion with the, with the Patriarchate of Antioch. Uh, mm -hmm. Within just a few years, they had to have a significant ecclesial ecclesiastical event right after an ecumenical council and then yeah. another ecumenical council within 20 years. So it's <laughs> it's like a yeah. really tumultuous time period. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it seems to me that Vatican II mm -hmm. or Vatican I as well, the, the similar things are going on at Vatican I, but in a different yeah. like on a different uh, side of the coin yeah, yeah. Uh, where you have machinations of various actors. Some mm -hmm. of them are actually bad faith, heretical in some way. Other than yeah. are just kind of good men who are too zealous. Um, yeah. And it seems to me that there was this animosity between these two different Orthodox parties at Vatican I and the same yeah. sort of animosity happening at Vatican II as well. I agree, yeah. Um, so like uh, the, the, one of the historical aspects of Vatican II mm -hmm. is that the the so-called um, European alliance was mm -hmm. this loose conglomeration of a party spirit of the Northern yeah. European uh, periti and bishops yeah. who were joining <clears throat> forces against the, the Curia and the, anything that they manifests an animosity that was going on before the council. And mm -hmm. I think that there's, there's blame to be had to the Curia for creating this animosity, this, this environment but mm -hmm. nevertheless, at the council, because of that that uh, historical yeah. tension, there was this uh, even among the good Catholics, the communio crowd Catholics, and all yeah. those like the good guys. Yeah. There was this uh, animosity towards people like Gary Goulagrange, so that he was yeah. vilified for decades among their circle. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. until now finally we're having a healing of those memories but there's this tension yeah. so I, I guess I, I don't really know who to i don't know if i can say well it was more the trads or more the communio and animosity we can all agree yeah. the progressives were at fault they're going off <laughs> deep end in some way but I yeah guess my emphasis here like that i put in my book city of god versus city of man is that there's a breakdown of these different parties in modernity starting before vatican one yeah through this period and after Vatican II, and now finally in sort of the ruins that we're dealing with of ruins of society now in this post, yeah, post, post, post world, whatever it is, trans AI, yeah, totalitarian yeah. technocracy we're dealing with. Yeah. 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 We can finally say, let's put aside the animosities and then let's actually fight this, this battle uh, for the faith. 
Can, yeah, I agree with you. There definitely is. You see this kind of tug and pull throughout history. I think Vatican I and Vatican II as councils are tugs mm -hmm. and pulls. And, um, you know, uh, I think also Vatican I, in a certain sense, made Vatican II possible, uh, where you can have a collegiality that doesn't reject the primacy. In fact, uh, there's a video I did with Dr. Sean Blanchard. It's my most recent one called Pistoia and Liturgical Reform. And uh, yeah, I, I, strong, I strongly recommend that video because, you know, especially if you're a traditionalist, watch that video. You'll see uh, how much I concede but and yet stand in where I stand, like I still I still disagree. But you'll see, I think, this dynamic that you're alluding to, Tim. And um, another thing I want to say is I I personally don't I don't think it's Trads versus Communio. I think it's Thomists versus Communio. And I'll, and I'll explain uh, because I think you're right. At the end of Principles of Catholic Theology, Joseph Ratzinger writes, yeah, we were like we were like schoolboys that, that had just graduated and burned all our books and moved on, you know? Oh, <laughs> and yeah. so, yeah, he, he's, uh, that part, that part is really interesting at the end of that book. Uh, so I, you know, I agree, especially after the council, uh, they won, they won a battle that was worth fighting in a certain extent. They went too far. They were a bit zealous, but it wasn't too far in the sense of not Orthodox, just too far in the sense of they were uh, annoyed at, at that kind of oppression that you speak of, you might say. Uh, and you're right, it is coming back. And so we're bringing back, we're, we're saying, sorry, Thomas, come back. We're sorry. Uh, the world is crazy. Uh, you know, so I, yeah, me mea culpa. You know, I'm not part of, I'm not partisan, but I do like those authors. So I'll gladly say mea culpa. But that's the Thomas. I think traditionalism, and this I think people won't like. So please don't jump down my throat, people. <laughs> but <laughs> tra traditionalism, I think, is associated more with Lefebvre as a founder of a movement. Because the fraternity that moves out of that. Now, I know Institute of Christ the King, it's its own thing. Uh, there's even uh, Institute of Bon Pasteur. I don't know how you say it in English, but there's another group out there. And, but it, it's what they're pushing for is much more of an ecclesiology. I'm talking, the Thomists are just saying, we want our, our Thomas back. We want our commentaries back. So I'm like, yes, yeah. So I want that kind of cross fertilization between Thomists and Communio guys. And and there's also a rise in uh, in uh, Franciscan theology as well. Um, I can't remember his name. Someone who studied under Dr. Peter uh, Fellner, Peter Damien Fellner. I can't remember his name. Dr. Goff. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and so that's rising. That's good. Let's get more of that too. Uh, let's let's restore the subsidiarity and multiplicity of schools of thought. But traditionalism for me is what I said earlier. It, and I think it starts with Lefebvre. That, that's where I would draw the line. Now, people don't jump down my throat. If we disagree, we disagree. But that's that's kind of how I see it. I, I wouldn't sense. I would not really disagree. I would I would uh, I would double what you just said. And I oh, would really? say I would okay. say that traditionalism is the Cetus Internationalis Patrum at the council. All okay. of those bishops and what they were <clears throat> doing and what they <clears throat> were fighting for. That's traditionalism, gotcha. which is essentially which is Archbishop Lefebvre obviously was a leader in that group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, all of what they represented would be traditionalism, which is essentially the preconciliar popes and what they were saying about modernity. So you have the Chetus yeah. warning about what may happen if we mm -hmm. really do raise those bastions and all that. Yeah. Uh, we, we're going to have problems in River yeah. City if we do this. <laughs> yeah. Don't do it. So I think that there is, well, I think that there is some vindication about those warnings, yeah. even though I would still concede to like the great work of John Paul II, you know, who's, he's mm -hmm. a Gaudium et Spes guy. That's what John <laughs> Paul II is like his favorite document. Yeah. And uh, the great, well, he doesn't, he did. Yeah. Sorry. Because sorry. Of, even though, but even though I do love John Paul II, I will still say, I think he was a bit naive and people bad guys manipulated him in the Vatican. Yeah. And I think that if there was some more, <clears throat> some more of that realism of the Chetus, mm -hmm. but I mean, I, I would agree that uh, Archbishop of the is traditional movement, but more of more than that, even all these bishops, but there's other yeah. figures. Like for me, the, the biggest influence on my thought is mm -hmm. Dietrich von Hildebrand. Yeah. So he takes a different tack than the Thomas, obviously, but he's also right. a traditionalist. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, um, I, you know, I, I think the preconciliar, um, what you call the, the P in magisterium, I like that term. It's helpful. 
you know, I don't see a contradiction with it and with the council. I definitely do see a reform when it comes to, all right, we need to emphasize things differently. And I also see, so I'm, I'm conceding here that there is a kind of uh, optimism that backfired. Um, but that's different from saying those uh, doctrinal teachings of the council, the doctrine it was trying to put forth is problematic. That's not the same thing. But yeah, I think there was an optimism, but it's historically explainable. And, you know, I think we're saying the same thing here. It's just historically explainable because after the war, uh, you know, people were like, look, this is where liberalism brought us. Let's not make that mistake again. It's like the kid that got drunk and is in the hospital. The dad picks him up saying, see where that leads you. Now, you know, better. And then he, so he expects the kid won't do it again, but <laughs> he does. <laughs> so, um, you know, there is a kind of optimism as well as an explosion in Catholic intellectual life, as well as in the sciences with Einstein and others. So there was an uh, optimism that makes sense historically, but it backfired. So I, I agree. With yeah, I, I and I I have defended the opt I've actually defended the optimism of Vatican II, actually. So really, I've, yeah. I've written about why people were optimistic. There was a reason they were optimistic. Yeah. It, it yeah. seems weird to us, but exactly. it makes sense, I think, when you look at the time period. Agreed. Uh, there's something I want to ask you that's 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 very related, but it's also a mm -hmm. burning question. I sure. want to go all the way back to uh, Scott Hahn. You mentioned Scott Hahn, <laughs> Kinship yeah. by Covenant, because yes. I just started reading it, actually. I'm on, like, page 50. Ooh, it's very and, good. Uh, yeah. Can you tell me more about what that hermeneutical key of the scripture, how that impacted your thinking yes. uh, at the time, and how is, has that remained significant for you over these years? Yes, absolutely. Covenant. That's what it was. Covenant. Uh, Han introduced me to that crucial concept of covenant, and it explains almost everything to me because it, it shows it actually it, it even gives you the key to understanding the Protestant Catholic debate over soteriology. Because uh, the, the Protestant will say, you know, justification is this legal imputation. Sanctification is not justification. It's more of a the result in your life because you're happy. You, you've been declared innocent but you're still guilty. You know, simul used to set peccator, as, as Luther would say. But covenant explains that salvation is communion. And, you know, communion is relationship with Jesus and with God. Uh, you know, a corporate one, the church's relationship. It's not just me and Jesus. But that means that a friendship can deepen, uh, you know, and you can be forgiven, re-included into that friendship, that kind of declaration, you're no longer my enemy. But I can become closer to you. So covenants, and you look, I mean, the, the whole history of the Old Testament and how the new fulfills all things in this new and everlasting covenant, that makes sense of soteriology. It also makes sense of eschatology, how uh, the fulfillment of all things is the communion of the cosmos with God when he elevates it and makes it divine in a certain sense. Uh, you know, theosis, Not you no, know, it doesn't share the same nature as God, but the same activity of God. And uh, so, yeah, to this day, that text has been pivotal. Uh, I think even Han uh, eventually starts to move away from some of the elements that he uses. I think he just had to because he was in school, but he's uh, maybe a little, that's something else. He's overly sympathetic to aspects of the historical critical method, but I think he has a kind of trajectory there. But that's funny because that's also been my trajectory. Reading Benedict has made me more critical of the criticism of uh, historical criticism. So yeah, no, Han is huge. Uh, that book was the kind of first step into uh, a, a deeper hermeneutic of the Catholic faith that helped me talk to Protestants. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to get into that. I've got, um, we have a Bible reading group where we go through the whole scriptures every year, but yeah. <laughs> it was so funny. Chris, Chris plans what up to me. I'm like, yeah, we read the Bible every year. He's like, dude, I read it every month. <laughs> <laughs> he's got like, uh, he's got some like audio version that you like read on, yeah 1.5 speed you know about this uh no i don't i was no. like well i'll have to do i'll have to do that sometime i've never <laughs> read the bible in a month yeah. that's a tough one that is tough yeah so um, anyhow well yeah no, uh, wonderful this is good i i I, I, like, I really yeah. appreciate um you reaching out to andrew uh to me um and, and talking with with everyone I, at, at first I, I think i told you this i was i was a little weary of uh, everyone talking, you know, uh, because I, I do believe in like in essentials, unity in, in opinions, diversity and all charity. Uh, so I think some of the questions that we're talking about uh, when it comes to the SSPX do veer into the essentials category. Uh, that being said, I do appreciate uh, you trying to navigate these waters yourself. 
right? And then talking to people, I don't think that's that's bad. So I appreciate that. And I'm glad to have talked to you about it. So <laughs> yeah, well, this yeah. is the uh, like you just said previously, um, our apostolate, meaning if Catholic, our goal is to restore the rival school of, of Christendom. Mm -hmm. uh, Christopher Dawson wrote in 1960, yeah. he said that the uh, Catholic education before the council was mm -hmm. so ideological, it was like Marxism. People were forced <laughs> oh, to wow. do this yeah. and that, and there was no rival schools. Yeah, And so it makes sense that there was this overreaction at and after the council because mm -hmm. there was this intense, which, which is, that's not traditional. That The traditionalism, truly traditional Catholic <laughs> Christendom is these rival schools. Yeah. So yeah. that's what we're all about. I mean, if Catholic, that's why I go on yours or other channels and try to yeah. have this conversation. Yeah. Uh, because that's what I believe. That's what I wrote in my book is, is I think yeah. that, that is what is the answer. Because I think when we look at history, that's the, that's the method that God uses yeah. to help to heal wounds, ecclesial wounds, as well as, yeah. Uh, achieve that that doctrinal synthesis that's necessary to overcome heretical depravity in any given period mm -hmm. yeah amen yeah wonderful well tim thanks so much for uh this co wonderful conversation uh just to put in a plug for my channel and then i'll let you <laughs> put a plug in for yours uh, first of all like subscribe and hit that notification bell uh if you enjoy this content support us at patreon.com slash the logos project we also have a blog post, uh, a blog post website, uh, the Ecclesia blog, if you want to read some articles there. And uh, Tim, any plug for your content, your book, uh, what your work, everything? Sure. Well, you can you can buy my book, City of God versus City of Man, the battles of the church from antiquity to the present. And uh, you can subscribe to Meaning of Catholic. That's um, that's our YouTube channel. It's also meaning of Catholic dot com. Awesome. All right. Well, everybody, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you guys next time.